Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Hunt the Wild podcast. I'm your host Adam Bolds and today I'm joined with Tiffany Sanders. Uh, she's a Florida resident. I believe she's born and raised there. How are you doing Tiffany? Uh, I wasn't born here but I've been here oh. a long time so close enough. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm doing um, great. I actually was born in Virginia but I moved here about when I was about six or seven years old, old and I've been here ever since. But Could you, I claim, uh, could I claim. you tell everybody? Oh, sorry. Could you tell everybody a little bit um, about yourself and maybe how you got involved in like hunting in the outdoors? Okay. Well, um, I did not grow up in the outdoors. Um, I actually came from a very large family and um, I'm, the, I'm the oldest of six children. So having that many children, we didn't have lots of fun extracurricular activities. So when I met my husband in high school, we're high school sweethearts. So um, his family was really big into hunting. And so that's really where I kind of picked up on it. But even for, for the first several years, I would tag along and just I've, I've always been a student. So I would just watch everything that was going on and just learn. And then we started having children and I was home with children. We have four children. And so there was like a full decade of my life that I was, you know, raising babies and um hunting kind of fell to the wayside because to be honest, I was exhausted. I was raising four children, three of them boys, very, very uh, energetic <laughs> boys. So as they started to get a little more old, you know, older and a little more independent, I started having more freedom to get out in the outdoors. And um, I just, I love it so much. Um, I think I've may maybe even has surpassed my husband's love of hunting and have started to annoy and drive him crazy with <laughs> it. <so. laughs> So when you, when you were going with him hunting, um, did you kind of fall in love with it right away or was it just kind of like you went mm. with him cause he's going all the time and you wanted to hang out or. No, I have always been in love with the outdoors. I've always been an outdoors person. Um, I grew up on a horse ranch and, um, I spent the majority of my time outdoors working with them, you know, a lot of you know, feeding up, rolling hay out. And then many nights I would just climb up in the rafters of the barn and just watch the stars. I just love to be outdoors. So when I met him and he lived this outdoor lifestyle and it got me further into the outdoors, I just fell even more in love with it. I just started seeing things I'd never seen and experiencing things I'd never experienced. And it just turned into a monster, really. <laughs> so um, I kind of want to talk about your first kill. Um mm -hmm. How far along in the process were you? Was that small game or was it a deer? Turkey. Um, a, a turkey. turkey. It was my first. Yes. Um, and it was so beautiful and so perfect that it's really what hooked me. So we had li we were living on a property that um, was in the front of a hay field and we had gotten permission from the landowner to hunt. And so I went out with my husband. I had been practicing with a shotgun. I was ready and it lined up beautifully. He called the turkey in for me. We were kind of sitting behind a cluster of trees. And when he came out, he literally, as soon as he stepped out from behind the cluster of trees, I just pulled the trigger and that was it. But hearing him come in when he was gobbling and strutting and then the drumming, I felt like I could feel the drumming in my chest. And it just I was hooked for at that moment. I was hooked. I, mean, I just I love turkey hunting. <laughs> Do you think you would have been um, as hooked had you not killed killed the turkey or if it would have went sour, maybe you wounded it and didn't find it? Or you think um, I know that's hard. That's a hard question to answer. But right, right. Um, being the animal lover that I am, I think if I would have wounded one right off the bat and was not able to recover, that may have been disheartening. But even if he would not have come in experiencing that display with the sun rising and the fall, I mean, it just it was magical. So I think other than maybe having a really bad experience, which still would have maybe only deterred me for a little while because I'm pretty persistent. But um, I don't know. I don't think much could have messed up that morning. It was just gorgeous. That's interesting that you use the word animal lover because I use that a lot with my wife. And it's not something that you hear a whole lot in, in the hunting world. I mean, usually you hear hunters you hear the word kill, but you never really hear the word animal lover, right. um, which I'm an animal lover myself. I think a lot of hunters are, but you just, you, for some reason, you don't hear about it. Um, does that ever cause conflict with you um, yes. when it comes yes. to 
any killing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I do find myself using the word harvest more than kill. Uh, whether that's, I don't know. I'm, I, I actually just realized that about myself. Um, because while I don't waver in my belief in my way of life, I do hope that I can attract more people into the outdoors. So I try to be sensitive, but um, I also, we have a small farm. We, tr we strive to eat what we raise or hunt primarily. And so I've also raised meat chickens. I've raised, I raised pigs. Um, and it is one of those things where to this day, when harvest day comes, I still cry because I, you know, I have chosen because, because I am a, a meat eater and because for me, eating meat is one of the most sustainable ways to get protein for myself and my family. We don't have these large fields to grow alternative methods of, of procure, procuring protein. We eat meat. And so I choose, because I eat meat, to be close to the process. And um, I feel like if I'm going to eat meat, that these animals should have one bad day ever. And really, that should be as humane and swift as possible. Yeah, that's really well said. I, I say those exact words. I say yeah. those exact words all the time. I, yeah. I hate, honestly, I hate killing the animal. That's my least favorite part of the hunt. I enjoy the chase. I enjoy the, the experience. I enjoy documenting it. But I mean, as far as killing the animal, it's, it's hard. It's hard for people. And um, for me too, I, I like that animal to die quickly. I don't like him to be or her. Uh, grown up in a barn or grown up in maybe not a barn is the right word, but um, industrial farming, it just right. kind of rubs me wrong. So right. I'm the same way. We don't, we don't buy very much meat from the grocery mm -hmm. store, maybe a bag of chicken here and there, but um, yeah. for us, we eat a lot of venison. Um, how did you feel after you shot that turkey? Were you super emotional or? Um... I was, I was, I was shocked that I was able to even do it. First of all, I just was shocked that it lined up that I aimed and I shot and, and I made contact. And then I was overwhelmed with a sadness, like, okay, I, I just took a life. It's kind of like ups and downs. Yeah. Um, but also I am, um, I do really love providing food for my family. Like I said, I have, I have three boys and a daughter and my boys play football and weightlift and they eat a lot. <laughs> and I love knowing that I'm providing them a, a good, healthy source of, of, of food. So you can, I feel like you kind of go back and forth and I don't know if that's for everyone. I don't know if that's just me, but there's highs and lows. There's moments of excitement and then sadness and then respect. And it just, it kind of goes you run through all the emotions, I think. Was that something that was on your radar prior to killing your first animal, prior to killing that turkey? Did you realize how how you would be emotional or not completely? I suspected and I was fearful of how I would feel because mm -hmm. I had never I mean, I had worked in the veterinary field. And so my only experience with an animal dying was when we purposely took an animal's life to put it out of misery or because it did not have a quality, any more quality of life. And it was, you know, they just kind of went to sleep and it was peaceful. But um, so I, I, I didn't know how that was going to differ. So um, it did bring me peace and comfort to know that because I made a good shot and it was an ethical kill, that animal never even knew it happened. I mean, it was just instant. So that that's really important to me. And that does give me peace and alleviate um, some of the emotions that I do well by that animal and respecting it. So um, you hunted with your husband quite a bit before you kind of Okay. took up the gun yourself. Mm -hmm. Were you ever with him when he killed something? Yes. Yeah. Did that, did that make you feel the same way as when you killed something? No, um, not as intense. Yeah. Um, there definitely were some emotions, but because it wasn't me, um, it, it maybe was a little more muted. The, the, the emotions are maybe a, a little more muted than they would be if it was me, my own hand, my own weapon. So it's just not as uh, personal. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes total sense. Um, 
so I know that there's a lot of people that start out hunting at a young age, but I know there's a lot of adults that get started a little later, like you did. Mm -hmm. Would you have any kind of suggestions or um, maybe you could cover some of the struggles that you went through as um, getting in it maybe a little bit later in life? Yeah. Um, so I feel like I had to play catch up because yeah. um, I did spend so much time raising my family and I don't regret that a minute. I, I loved every second of that. And I loved really kind of what I felt like I was doing for me. I, I was uh, blending the two worlds. So here I was a mom and parenting these children. And then I transitioned into a mom that was now out enjoying the outdoors and hunting and I was able to bring them along with me. So those experiences, as I learned, even though I did not know everything, I still was able to pass on what I did know to my children. And so they've sat with me many a time. And I remember each day that my child, each one of my children sat with me for their last time. And then that first time they sat by themselves and me being in another stand and crying a little bit and then, you know, trying to resist the urge to check on them. And are they going to fall asleep? Are they going to fall? You know, all these different things. And then them being successful and seeing the excitement in them and them telling the story. And it's just, uh, it, it just kind of felt like I was just, I don't know, it's just making it a part of your life. Um, and so instead of it being kind of like just this hobby or this undertaking, it just became another facet of my life that I kind of picked up, started small, like everything else. I think you just learn one thing at a time. And when you feel like you are successful at that one thing, then you add one more thing. Um, this is something I teach all the time as a nurse. You can't go and, and just go gung ho overnight. Start with match everything that's non-water that you drink with the same amount in water, like start somewhere and master that and then add one more thing. And I, I adopted that attitude with hunting as well. Now um, you said you hunt with your husband and your kids mm -hmm. and stuff. Do you ever hunt solo? I do. I do. I actually, as my children have gotten older and um, my husband has gotten to a place where he maybe I wouldn't say he prefer. he's gotten really, really heavy into duck hunting because it's something that he and the boys can do together. And the boys really love it because they don't have to be quiet and they don't have to be still. And so it's just, it's fun and adrenaline laden. And I love more of a still hunting. I, I do that with them because I love the memories, but I love the peace and the solitude and the, the stillness. And so, um, especially this year, I've hunted more solo than I ever have before. And it's been a little bit of a hurt because I was afraid at first, like, what does mm -hmm. this look like? And, and um, so there are several different safety measures that I adopted to make me feel more comfortable hunting solo as a woman on public land. So, so um, as like, you know, a, a new adult hunter or whatever, how long did it take you before you felt comfortable going out on your own? Was it like a year, two years? Or was it like um, it, later it, on into the journey? Yeah, it's, 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 it's adapting over time. Yeah. Um, as I face new things, like for instance, um, first it was just getting comfortable with just being out there by yourself and thinking about, okay, what do I need to do? So, okay. As soon as I pull into the wildlife refuge or the WMA, I drop a pin there in case I lose my signal. And then when I get to the spot where I park the truck, I drop a pin. And then, you know, so it's like leading these breadcrumbs. And then when I got comfortable with that, um, I realized that I feared people more than I feel feared the outdoors. So there was that whole thing of when a truck full of men would drive by and see me walking by myself with my cart, um, getting over that, like, okay, how does this work? How do you act? Okay. Do you act like my husband's right over there? Yeah. Most of them don't ever believe you're out there by yourself anyway. So that's kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now I've realized that it's the little surprise things. Um, when you're wading out of a Creek in the middle of the night and there's a big grumpy water moccasin that's decided he's going to take up residence right where you need to cross. Okay. So what do I do about this? I'm here by myself. I have a stand on my back. How do I handle this ethically? you know, legally, all those different things, you know, just those things, those little surprises that pop up that you have to deal with as you go along. So I know um, I w I've been wanting to cover a little bit of um, like diversity and hunting and yeah. like the hunting world for a while. So what do you feel like is the 
the biggest boundary to new hunters and I'd say outdoorsmen mm -hmm. um, from diverse groups. Yeah. Well, this applies to everything. So hunting is not um, excluded, but um, I would say the big word for me is exclusivity. So it's division. It's um, anytime we get an attitude about the way we think something should go or the way somebody should hunt or the things that they should wear or how long it should take them to find sign or whatever. And then we project that frustration on those people. Um, and I've seen this with men towards women when I've had women reach out and say, you know, my husband doesn't want me to hunt with them. My boyfriend doesn't want me to hunt with them. And I just want to hunt. So I see it there. I see it in uh, women towards men where men feel like, because one man mistreated one woman in the field one time, now this woman hates every man in the field or doesn't want, maybe not, maybe hates too strong. Um, kind of has an attitude like, um, I'm going to show you up and I don't need you. And it, none of those things, there's nothing wrong with it, but just this is they're You're carrying a chip of, di of uh, divisiveness. Mm -hmm. But I also see it with women and women sometimes, you know, you hear this phrase all the time. It's become very popular talking about your tribe, find your tribe. And unfortunately, what I found is that um, women can, not all of them, but some of them can only be excited about being a part of a tribe if everybody does everything just the way they do it with mm -hmm. along their time frame and no one's slowing them down and, you know, nobody's hindering them in any way. Um, but sometimes I feel like, even, you know, hunters in general, but even sometimes women towards women, if someone's a newer hunter than them, there can just be this expectation that discourages that new hunter. And the way I see it, I mean, this is, it's not really, it, it's not a, a race. It's not a culture. It's not a gender. It's a human problem. Mm -hmm. Anytime we value our personal success over the big picture, which is getting as many people into the outdoors as possible, which increases our voter base, which increases our support for these public lands and the outdoors that we love. Um, anything that hinders that, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. <laughs> and it's just I don't like divisiveness. Why do you why do you think it's so divisive? Like when it comes to, you know, like camo and what you you know why does it matter did you well i think it's the same thing that it's been back since junior high mm -hmm. um it's low for for many people it's a low self-confidence so they find their value in these labels or this type of weapon or you know this type of thing and um they feel like if they accept someone who is doing something differently, then somehow that takes away from who they are and what they've accomplished and their value when really that's, that's not true. That's, that's a lie. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it seems like people or hunters rather are in competition with each other when really it's, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of a competition for myself. Right. I like to challenge myself and I like to see if I can do certain things mm -hmm. I like to set goals. But I mean, gosh, I don't know. We got to get away from what camo you wear and all that stuff. Like right. we all start somewhere, we figure out what works mm -hmm. best for us and we just kind of roll with it. Um, so I see a lot of groups of guys when I'm out hunting. I never do see big groups of girls. Do you think there's a reasoning behind that? Well, um, something that I experienced this past weekend, um, there was a woman hunter, a lady hunter that had come out. It was her first time hunting. And um, I could see that while she was so excited to be out there hunting, there was this certain level of um, fear and comparison that was going on. And um, I, I realized, you know, I kept encouraging her, like, for instance, she would compare, you, you know, well, I don't have the right kind of camo and man, my boots aren't tall enough and this. And, and I finally yeah. just said, you know, I'm like, listen, you, you know, you, you, it takes time to figure out what works for you, depending upon where you're hunting and don't feel bad. Look at you, you're out here. And I think if we could adopt more of that attitude, um, 
you know, something has happened um, to women and friendships where it's almost like for most women, and again, I'm not saying all because I have a couple of very close friends that, but there's like a pseudo friendship that has occurred. Mm -hmm. where, you know, as long as we have similar interests and you add to and you benefit me, then um, you can be my friend. But if you ever don't agree with me or if you ever upset me or if you ever hurt me, whether it's intentionally or not, then I, I can't forgive you. I'm done. And what I have found, especially with the two closest relationships that I have, who I've been friends with both of them since high school, I've never was a person that had a lot of friends. I was, I've always been kind of a loner. And these two friends have been my friends since high school is there is this real beauty. And um, I've said this elsewhere, but in allowing people in and living in the risk zone of knowing that human relationships are going to be painful, whether it's purposeful or not. And that sounds really, really deep for hunting, but really it's not. That's why you don't see a bunch of women together because unless there's some benefit for them, like if we have to struggle and, and see the worst of each other and possibly fail in front of each other, then all of a sudden we're not about that life. <laughs> and it's just a sad thing because there is a really cool connection that comes from tripping through things together and making somebody mad and having to say, oh gosh, I messed that up. I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry. Um, just all those dynamics. Um, I, I think the hunting world is reflecting what's going on with women just in the world in general is that there's this, this weird pseudo friendship where there's nothing deep. There's nothing real. We can't disagree. We can't discuss very, you know, differing views because if you disagree with me, then you're mad at me or you dislike me. That's, that doesn't have to be the case. And so that reflect that, that mirrors, I mean, that just kind of translates over into to the hunting world and everything else. You think that could cause some problems in the duck blind with loaded guns? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, probably. So, so. <laughs> is there a way we can fix that? Is there a way that, that um, people can get around that kind of stuff? Or you think mm -hmm. that's just, um, just in like a woman's nature? I know guys, mm -hmm. guys can be that way too, but maybe not as much. Yeah. Well, you know, um, with, I think with women, you know, I have this mindset that big, broad ideas, this, this translates into to politics, it translates into um, poverty, it translates to so many different things. But these big, big machines don't accomplish a, a, as much as one person, person um, reaching out into their personal sphere of influence and doing the next good thing there. And to me, that's where this is going to be solved is when each person says, okay, as uncomfortable this is, as this is going to be, and as much as this is going to feel like I'm going upstream, I'm going to choose in my little, little sphere, of, sphere of influence to be that person that it makes other people comfortable, to be that person that's encouraging, to be that person that admits my faults. And hopefully, I mean, from what I've experienced, it, it becomes contagious and there's kind of a ripple effect that occurs. Yeah. So maybe we just need a, we need a few women out there to just kind of take it by the horns and yeah, dive in absolutely. and maybe it'll be. That got, that got really deep, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's you good. That's good. About hunting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to probably catch a lot of flack for this and I don't really care because I've been wanting to talk about it for a while, but mm. I want to talk about the word huntress. And how I feel, um, it's kind of, to me, it's divisive. It, it separates hunters as a whole and in, into groups. And we're already um, attacked enough. So for me, I don't care for the word. How do you feel about the word hunters? Well, I, I'm on the same boat as you are when it comes to div divisiveness. As you heard me up to this point, I feel like I'm just been spewing how much I dislike dis divisiveness. I also dislike labels. Mm -hmm. um, I see people 
behave in ways that they would not have had they not felt like they needed to live up to a label. And um, I fear sometimes I don't I think I think if you're going to be against divisiveness, then you also can't be offended by people that choose to use that term. So it's a kind of a double edged sword. So it does not offend me for someone to use the term huntress. I don't get mad or angry. It doesn't change anything about my day. I'm personally not going to use that term in my sphere of influence because um, to me, it's just about quit being so loud with your voice and be more loud with your actions and just do your thing. And it speaks for itself. Um, so that's kind of where that's what my mindset is. And that's kind of how I strive to do things. And again, I have no problem if you want, if you love that word and that that word for you evokes a sense of belonging and a sense of motivation and a sense of pride, then wonderful. But unfortunately, all words don't carry the same definition. We we have definitions of words in our mind according to our perspective, according to the way we were raised, according to what we've experienced. So as long as we all are sensitive to the fact that the, the definition of the world may, word may not be the same for everyone, you know, I mean, it's just one of those live and let live. But I personally don't use the word because I just don't like labels, period. I just want to get out there and do my thing and <laughs> let it just speak for itself. <laughs> so I catch the word huntress a lot on. Um, I'm sure you see it on Instagram. I'll see like um, a girl dressed, maybe not how she would normally dress, maybe <laughs> in a certain way. Do you feel like people ever use the word or women ever use the word huntress to kind of sexualize uh, hunting? Well, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I've kind of paid attention to this and I actually find the opposite sex posting pictures of women dressed that way. And then using that hashtag huh. more, I think, than really? women using them for themselves. Not that it never happens. But I kind of like I like I told you earlier before we got started, I kind of maybe it's the nurse in me or maybe this is why I became a nurse. But I'm always paying attention to trends. I'm always paying attention to patterns. And so I've been keeping this little tally mark in my mind. And I've actually found men posting pictures of women and using that hashtag more than women using it for themselves. So whatever. That's the, that's the gain of following then. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the nature of the game. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. it's about followers, especially if you're monetized, you need those followers. And I mean, I'm yeah. not going to judge what somebody does, especially if that's a, I'm, I'm, I know people that social media is their primary source of income. And um, I again, when it comes at the end of the day, them doing that does not affect me in my personal world and what I'm going to do out in the woods and what I'm going to teach my daughter and what I'm going to teach my sons. And it doesn't affect that or how I'm going to treat other women and men in the field. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, you got to have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> so the last thing kind of to touch on that, do you worry that um, that kind of influence using Huntress and sex, maybe sexualizing stuff, do you think that's, detrimental to hunting? Do you think that can ruin it um, in the future? You know, sexualizing anything is detrimental across the board. We just, we're a hypersexual society, unfortunately. There's not much that's left honorable or sacred anymore. Um, what people choose to do to get to, to meet the algorithm so that they can fund their lifestyle you know, that's not for me to judge, but I am not super concerned about its impact because I really, really believe in that person to person influence, that personal sphere, like I keep saying. Um, and I really believe the, in the power of that because I've seen it at work. And um, I just I believe that each person doing their thing and um, being kind and um, teaching others and bringing others into the field, I believe that'll be enough to cancel out the negativity that, that we're experiencing because it doesn't affect me. So there's plenty of other people that it doesn't affect. I think some of these things that affect you, if you choose to let it affect you. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, somebody posting up a picture with a huntress does not affect my skill and ability to get out and find deer in the woods in any way, shape or form. So, and at the end of the day, yeah. scroll past it and move on yes exactly 
So we're going to talk a little bit about Florida hunting. Can you kind of explain to me where you hunt in Florida? You don't have to give away your best spots or anything, yeah. but um, <laughs> kind of what the terrain looks like down there. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've vacationed down there, but I've never mm -hmm. been like out in the bush in Florida. So I don't really right. have any idea. I imagine it being like real thick and there's alligators everywhere and yeah. snakes and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Can well, you kind of paint it, the picture? It is. So the, the majority of the places that I hunt are wetland swamp type areas. That's where I love to hunt because in Florida, to me, I equate it to what, you know, the vast expanses in Canada or in the, you know, in the Yukon must be like, it's, it's, the closest you get in Florida to untouched territory. And in order to accomplish that, you have to get out in the thick, wet stuff where the alligators and the snakes are. <laughs> so our terrain, um, there's a lot of uh, palmetto flats. And these palmetto flats, when I explain it to you, they are these thick, uh, dense areas where when the palmettos grow, they kind of follow this serpentine root system where the the root systems come up and down like this and then you had dead you have dead palm fronds that kind of fall over that so as you're walking through that you are literally stepping knee deep down into dried palm fronds if it's a dry area so your biggest concern there are going to be rattlesnakes or as it gets wetter i mean just a few weekends ago I was out and I was stepping through and, and felt something pop my foot and looked down and sure enough, I had stepped on a water moccasin and he was popping the front of my, my boot. And I was thankful mm. for my good boots. Um, so that's part of it. The, um, I try not to just go wading around in alligator infested water. <laughs> you know, the, I, I'm mindful of the, you know, sunrise and sunset when they're most active, you, you kind of have to learn how these animals, um, behave. So to me, if you figure out the way they behave, not that animals always behave the way they're supposed to, but for the most part, they do. Rattlesnakes are going to be in this area. Mock you know, water moccasins or copperheads are going to be in this area. Alligators are going to act like this at these times of day. So if you keep all that in mind and you are being really aware of your surroundings, then you're good. Now, the big thing about Florida to me is our vines. We have something called cat claws that are just these thick vines that get in and wrap around everything. And they just have these long thorns on them that will just, it's, they're, they're ruthless. And so much of the area that you hunt, like for instance, this past weekend, I was hunting hogs and uh, at, in lower Swanee uh, national wildlife refuge. And so in order to get out to where these hogs were, there were these islands that kind of butted up to these marsh flats and the marsh flats were tidal. So even when they were dry, they were this thick, gunky mud. And then as the tide would come in, they would get several inches in water that if you didn't watch it, you'd sink right down to your knee in it. And then the marsh grass was this thick um, grass that literally, if you try to push your body through, you can only move in like six inch intervals. And really the only way to move through it is to get down on your hands and knees and follow pig trails. So there's that. <laughs> um, so it is, it is challenging. I've had people say to me before, especially people that live out in areas that, that are wide open, maybe Alaska or Montana saying, you know, I don't know why Florida hunters make such a big deal when they stalk and hunt something. And my response to that is, is because this terrain, like you can't see your hand in front of your face. Yeah. We have a lot of mangroves. We had a lot, we have a lot of these myrtle type thick bushes that when you're standing there, it's four five, six foot high all around you and you can see nothing. <laughs> and so you're trying to follow trails, find sign, and then get up above it a little bit so you can see down in it. Um, and it's, it's very challenging. Definitely. So for me, I, I'm used to hunting Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, or, you know, Kentucky, more Midwestern states that have farm ground and some woods that are open and stuff. If I ever wanted to travel to Florida or somebody like me wanted to travel to Florida, what are some of the main challenges they might face? Is it mostly just that terrain stuff, trying to figure that out? Because I can mm -hmm. imagine that being a shock to me. I mean, I can't even imagine crawling through all that thick stuff and i'm sure it's hot most of the year right yeah yeah it is it's hot um you know and the snakes move more when it's hot so um it's extremely humid extremely humid people don't understand 
the humidity in Florida, other, save maybe a couple of states. Um, but it's just literally like if you took a whole bowl, a, a cast iron pan of water and put it in the oven and turn it to 500 degrees and then opened it where you literally feel like it's going to send your eyelashes off when it hits you in the face. It can, it, it's that way, you know, in bow season, <laughs> you know, yeah. super hot, super hot. The mosquitoes, I mean, we have huge mosquitoes um, that sometimes will just threaten to carry a thermocell right off, not even be phased by it. Mm. Um, so then you're trying to find a day where there's a little bit of a breeze. So that'll help keep those at bay. We have a lot of hunters, a lot of hunters. Um, and, you know, you hear all the time, well, Florida doesn't have big deer. Well, if you, if you, if you look, there are big deer, but you really have to go deep and far and go through the most challenging ground to, to find the nicest deer. Hogs are, some people say they're easier to find. I think maybe the ground that they cover is easier to identify, but to me, hogs have a better nose than deer. So you have to really be tricky about fooling them and really watch your wind because they'll pick you up to me five times as fast as a deer will. Huh. Um, so, yeah, so those are just some of the things. So um, I grew up having the rut around me around November. And I know a lot of like Midwestern states, it's kind of falls within that area. Right. You were telling me that that the rut falls like, is it like end of February or something there? So basically the first rut, Florida is really cool. And while we don't have the biggest deer in the nation and, and all that thing, we have just about a nine month long rut if you're willing to drive three or four hours in every direction so the first rut starts back in july and then there's a rut all the way through until almost march so you know for instance at at my my personal piece of property i have a piece of property that acts as a um how do they say it? It attracts deer bucks, but it doesn't hold bucks. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very protective of my does that live there because I know for one week in October, they draw the bucks out of the swamp because I kind of have a funnel for my property. And that is the only time that I hunt my property. And then the rest of the time I leave it alone and, you know, I start figuring out, I start chasing ruts. And so it's just really cool because you can drive an hour in this direction and catch this rut, drive an hour in that direction and catch that rut. It's really unique as a state as far as the rut's concerned. So is, uh, is Florida a one buck state or can you kill multiple bucks there? No, you can kill five deer total. Um, so you, yeah, you can kill five total a year unless unless you get a doe tag or something like that. And then, um, so you can kill does, but only two can be does. So you can kill does in archery season. And then once archery seasons season pass, we usually have a doe weekend. So if you don't have a doe tag or you're not on, sometimes some of the wildlife refuges will have special doe days on their own. They kind of make their own rules. It seems like, (laughs) but, um, so yeah, it's five deer. So five bucks then? It, it can be bucks. It yeah. can only be two does. Okay. We, you know, so only two of those can be does. That, so that's, can that's funny because it's like opposite where I live. Like you can like almost just keep buying as many doe tags as you want, but you can only kill one buck. Right, right. Um, yeah. Are you big into Are you big into the scoring thing with deer? Um, as well, far as like measuring them and that's all that? hard to say because, you know, I have killed deer in Georgia. Um, this year was the first year that I killed a Florida buck. Um, so the, all of my previous bucks were killed in Georgia. So we have this little deal with a a business acquaintance where we're allowed to go out like two or three days once a year. And it's kind of like a, a favor to us. And we just really, really love it. And that's where I've killed bucks up to this point because I've been learning the bucks on my own property. And every, each year, like I finally feel like, I've, I've been studying them now for about seven years and I think I finally have them figured out for this upcoming archery season. But um, I'm one of those t- people that tends to be really, really cautious. So if I think I can't do it right, or I think things aren't um, the, the, the uh, things aren't just right. I don't want to just go out there and just pressure and, and make a mess. So I try to save my, my visits out to when I think it's going to be the most impactful and have the best chance. But um, so that being said, I haven't harvested a buck yet that maybe 
I mean, I had one that I measured because he was super wide and, and he was really old and on the decline. His his antlers were starting to lose some mass because he was so old. So I just measured, you know, his antlers yeah. and score him per se. Um, but no, I mean, I'm not saying that I'll never care about that, but that's not really something that's on my radar now. I don't know. It's not really that's not my type of thing. I love the chase so much. Yeah, and that's not really doesn't stand out to me. I've talked before about, about the measuring thing. I didn't grow up measuring deer. It wasn't really on my radar mm -hmm. until about 10 years ago. I started hearing a lot about it and I've kind of, I've kind of steered away from it because I didn't want it to, I didn't want to be like, Oh, he's too little. Like I just wanted to shoot whatever I wanted to shoot when I felt like right. it was in the moment, but I did shoot a decent buck this year. And for me, I don't think, I think I just want to measure it to know um, mm -hmm. kind of where I, I stand when somebody says a class 130 or a 140 right. or whatever. At least know what that means. Yeah. But I don't, I don't so much care about like having to be like, having to kill one that's an inch bigger or kill one that's nice. 10 inches bigger the next year. I think it, mm -hmm. for me, I don't care. Like you can see the yeah. ones, you can see the one little basket racks on my wall. <laughs> like I'm yeah. super happy about those. And uh so with that, with that. that in mind, you know, um, the bucks that I've killed in Georgia, one of the stipulations of the farm that we have permission to hunt is, you know, don't kill it unless you're going to mount it, like make sure that it's something that, so there's, yeah. there is a little bit of pressure of, um, like the first year I went out there, I had no clue what was out there. And so my first buck that I ever harvested, harvested was a seven point. I was so proud. I, it was a heart shot at 208 yards. I was just so proud of him. And I, at that point, I didn't know how to hunt. You know, I'm sitting up on the, on the field and, you know, just waiting for him to come out during the rut. Didn't know anything about, um, you know, what the monsters that were down at the Creek bottom. <laughs> so yeah. each year, as I learned more and more, I killed a bigger buck and a bigger buck. But I can tell you that this past year when we went to Georgia, the last two years, I came home without a buck because I had probably six bucks come through my scope the first year before last and and one this this last year. But when I looked at them, I'm like, you know, that doesn't really exceed what I've already accomplished. So I just didn't feel right about it. I'm not saying that other people wouldn't. Um, it just didn't, it didn't get my butterflies up. So yeah. I just waited. But the buck that I killed here in Florida is far smaller than any of the bucks I killed in Georgia. And I can tell you with 100% honesty that I am more proud of that buck because I killed him out of rut because he was so old um, and there was just something about him when I walked up on him and, and, you know, he only ran about 20 yards, but when I walked up on him and, re and, and I saw the tattered ears and the holes in his ears and, and I just saw the age on him, his teeth, his teeth were so worn that they were be below his gum line and he had a swollen up arthritic front knee. I mean, he was the boss out there. I felt more accomplishment with that buck when I laid my hands on him because I knew we were right next door to a dog hunting club, even though we were still like, I knew in my heart how many times that buck had evaded hunters and I was the one that fooled him. It was just, and it wasn't because of a rut or, I mean, I just, I, I just was at the right place at the right time. And I worked, I walked really far and I, I, I took my summit stand up a, a tree that literally had like two teeth in it. And I was trying hard not to move too hard. Cause I, you know, it was just all the stuff and it just lined up just right. And, I'm just so proud of that buck. I'm proud of all of them, but I carry more pride with that buck. Plus, that was the first buck that I killed solely, completely on my own. I scouted. I studied the maps. I went out. I found the sign. I looked at the wind. I, I set my stand up. He actually was being chased by dogs in the hunting club over. Huh. I could hear the dogs. Um, he ran past my brother-in-law stand that was probably 300 yards away. And he said, a buck just ran past me. Well, I had waded through this ridiculous log flooded logging trail to get to the spot. So when he hit the logging trail, I heard him just crash and splash into the logging trail. So even though they weren't running, I'm like, well, what the heck, what, what do I have to lose? So I just let out three or four strong grunts. And I've had all this speculation come up about why this deer came to me, whether it was because he was 
in crisis and was just trying to find other deer. I've had some old timers tell me, oh, he was trying to throw them off on those young, dumb deer. And that's why he came that way. But he ran straight to me. And when he came around the corner of those trees, panting and slobbering and just the boss, like <laughs> it was it was amazing. It was really amazing. Did you feel um, did you feel a sense of relief when you killed your first buck by yourself? I did. I did. Yeah. Um, just that all that studying that like, obviously I haven't figured it all out. Nobody figures it all out. And that never do. About, <laughs> no, that's the thing about hunting that is maddening. And that's why I don't think there's any need to brag about your skill because one storm or one flood, I mean, everything changes. And so you have to refigure it out. Now there's some things that stay somewhat familiar, but for the most part, you have to relearn even an area that you've hunted six or seven years in a row yeah. all over again. And so to have those things line up, that's just, it's a rush for sure. So you just got back from a hog hunt. Was that, where was that at in Georgia? No, that was actually, in, that was at Lower Swanee uh, National Wildlife okay. Refuge. Yes. So can we talk about the details of that hunt? I seen that you were successful on Go Wild. I was, yes, I was successful. So um, this was actually, I've been hunt, hog hunting just two or three times before, and I've been with my husband whenever he killed one. And again, I'm like a sponge. I'm watching everything that's happening. I'm looking at the terrain. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. So we went out to this area. I had never been here before. I had already looked at the maps because that's my thing. Like I would just... <laughs> almost obsessively study the maps and then mm -hmm. look the topography over and then look at the ridges and then look at the satellite and try to figure out stuff. And, you know, my husband had always told me, you know, those hogs love the palm flats. So I'm walking, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of hunters were choosing to use stands and kind of set up. And um, I just decided that I just wanted to walk and kind of figure this out. I'm kind of always scouting for deer, no matter what I'm doing. If I'm duck hunting, I mean, I drive my family crazy. The last <laughs> duck hunting trip we went on, I just disappear. And they're like, where are you? I found a buck rub line and I'm following this trail up this little island. And they're like, we are duck hunting. <laughs> I'm, all, <laughs> I'm always deer hunting. Always. That's me too. Yep. On yeah. The so I love all hunting. But anyway, so I'm walking and um, I had probably gotten about a mile and a half in. And I had been seeing different little hog trails, but I saw a hog trail that was just super wide and there was lots of activity on it. So I'm like, hmm, I'm going to follow this hog trail. So I kind of get off the path and start following this hog trail. And the, the vegetation started getting more and more dense. And it's really tricky when you're going through palm flats because those dried palm fronds will bust you all day long. So you're doing these weird yoga type trying to stretch your leg out and find one mud spot to one mud spot so you can be as quiet as possible, trying to make sure you're also circling around so that the wind is in your face, all that stuff that, you know, you do anyways. Um, to me, hunting hogs is a lot like hunting, hunting deer. I yeah. kind of use a lot of the same, there's a little bit different terrain, but I use a lot of the same tactics. So as I got closer, I realized I stepped into like a bedding area. There was just tons of piles of droppings all, in, you know, congregated in one area. I'm like, okay, like we're, we're figuring something out here. Well, about that time I started hear, hearing some ruckus. So I start heading towards that sound. And so the first two hogs that I came up on were a, a small sow and a, and a boar piglet. So I was probably about a hundred yards from them. And um, as soon as I saw them, my heart just started beating out of my chest because I'm like, okay, how do I make all this line up? So um, I got, I had to go through this mud and my boot almost got stuck and I'm trying not to make noises in it and I'm trying to get through there super quiet. So I get up behind this palm tree and I'm looking at these, these pigs and I'm like, okay, if I shoot the small one first, the mom is probably going to run off. But if I shoot the mama first, there is a possibility that that boar piglet is going to hang for a minute because he doesn't want to leave and I might get a shot off on him. So I tried that. So I shot, hit the, the sow. She dropped. I rechambered turn. Sure enough, the boar piglet's just standing there looking like wh what just happened. And I was able to take him down too. So as I'm standing there, I walk up on him. I'm just, my heart's beating out of my chest. Cause I'm like, I just figured that out. That is awesome. Well, I'm looking at this ridiculous hog highway, just fresh sign tracks, everywhere. I'm like, there are more hogs in here. I just know it. So I just start going deeper up the trail. I really was just following pig trails. And it, it went from where it was like a five foot wide 
pig highway to where I was literally duck walking through these pig trails uh, through this sawgrass. There was actually one moment where I came up on a hog that was only about six feet from me and he never smelled me or knew what I was, but he kind of scurried away like something's coming up the trail. But I was like, I was just eye level, like, okay, maybe I need to like make sure what's in front of me. So I, I started hesitating and going a little more slowly because I didn't want to catch <laughs> to the face. So as I got closer, I hear these two boar hogs fighting. And to explain to you the sound, I mean, it just sounded like monsters. I mean, they're just fighting. And I basically at that point, I started going from the, at the bottom of each palm mound, the palm tree, the, the ground would mound up some. So I would, that was my goal. I would see a palm tree with a mound and I would quietly get to that palm tree and then climb up on the mound and peek around and see what I could see. And that's kind of was my tactic following him. So I would get up on those palm mounds and I would just see the grass shaking and I would hear it. And it was just the closer I got, the louder they got. So I got probably 30 yards from where they were fighting. And this was a really unique area because it was a palm flat that was kind of shaped like a little island that, that jutted out into the, to the marsh flats. And, and there was a little teeny low, like a little, little pond that was maybe only shin deep. So it was like this perfect little wallowing hole. And as I, each time I stood up, I realized I could see, and it was like all these highways coming together. And this was like a hub because of the way it stuck out. And there were just tons of hogs in there. So I got about 30 yards from where the boars were fighting. And again, my, I mean, I couldn't hardly even hear my heart was being so loud <laughs> and um, they're just fighting. And there were two different V's in the pig trail where they would struggle and I would be able to see them in those trails. So I just um, braced my rifle against the palm tree and just waited for them to struggle in front of one of those V's in the grass. And sure enough, they came across, they were fighting and tussling and I saw the head of one boar. So I took a shot, dropped him there. The other boar that he was fighting with kind of sprinted about 40 yards to my left. So I just spun around the palm tree and braced got him in the, in the scope. And, but when I, I was so excited, when I went to pull the trigger, I wasn't braced quite well enough. And I slid down an inch. Mm -hmm. so I hit him and he bucked, but it didn't drop him instantly. I feel pretty certain by the way those hogs were acting that if I could have simultaneously dropped them on the spot, like I had done, I probably could have killed three or four more because they just stood there <laughs> like, what's, what's happening? Yeah. When I hit that one, because it wasn't the shot I wanted to make, he took off screaming, flailing, and everybody scattered. So he ran off into the to the marsh flat, the salt flat, and um, I waited until I didn't hear him flailing around because I wasn't about to go out there not knowing how injured he was and all that stuff. Um, but when I went to retrieve him, I could not find him to save my life. And I promise you, I know I probably walked within three yards of him 10 times, but mm -hmm. it was so thick. I just couldn't find him. But, um, so I only was able to recover three of them and, you know, talk that over with the wildlife man uh, refuge manager and, and, you know, got his okay on that, that I really tried hard, but I couldn't recover them. And they were just thankful for us to be reducing the number, but it was, it was a blast. It was so much fun is um so hogs really aren't on my radar here in indiana they say that there's some like near the stripper pit areas old coal mine areas and stuff mm -hmm. so i don't know a whole lot about it but i do hear a lot that hogs are a problem in florida oh, yeah. yeah but i also hear that people really love to hunt them so i guess my question for you would be if if you had the power to totally eliminate all these hogs like just overnight with the snap of your fingers do you think you would do it or do you think mm -hmm. you would keep them around for, for people to hunt? Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, I I've seen the devastation that they cause. I've seen the thousands of dollars that they've cost farmers and ranchers. So that's really, that's really a touchy situation. You know, we have family that are cattle ranchers and we have close friends who have farms. And so that's hard to say. I can't say that I could justify keeping them around just for the sport because it's fun to hunt them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's, that's a hard question. I don't think I can really honestly answer that one, yeah. especially not after this weekend. Before this weekend, maybe I could have said, ah, I can take or leave them. But um, that, that got my heart beating, like hasn't happened in a little while. <laughs> so. Would you... If you had to pick, would you choose hunting hogs or deer? 
Oh dear. Deer win yeah. all the time. Deer win yeah. all the time. Yeah. Just because I like to eat, eat deer more. Yeah. <laughs> it's stomach driven. I am, my love language is food. I love food. I love to eat. I love to cook. And so for me, um, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to hunt mule deer or elk or, or moose yet. But for me, when I'm able to hunt, that's the most, you know, that's the bang for your buck. You know, you harvest one animal and you have all these meals of tasty food. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, that's the main drive for me too. I think some people, people don't care about the meat. I know there's a lot of people that shoot deer or shoot animals and they give it away. But for me, yeah. I'm shooting those deer, put them in my freezer and stock Absolutely. up. Yeah. So yeah. what is the, what's the public land, private land situation in Florida? Um, is it a lot yeah. of public land? Is it a lot of door knocking? Is it, um, do people just give access in Florida? How's that kind of no, work? No, no people, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with Florida. I think it's just people in general, you know, people just aren't as trustworthy as they were decades ago and farmers and you know, landowners are very leery about letting people on their property because everyone's heard of somebody who has been robbed or had things stolen or whatever. So that's, that's really a, a touchy subject. Um, there is tons of public land available here. Um, it's interesting because I had a conversation with somebody over the weekend because I had said something about hunting Ocala National Forest. That's one of the, the places that I've gone to hunt. I'm like, oh, we don't go there. It's too much pressure. Mm. Yes and no. I think that's just, you know, I heard somebody say the other day that everybody thinks their state is the most difficult state to hunt. I think it's just a thing, you know, yeah. whether that's a pride or every state has challenges that other states don't have. So in that respect, they're correct. But um, Florida has a lot of people in general. And now we have like 7,000 people a day moving to Florida because of our loose restrictions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, I personally, I'm on several different Facebook sites, you know, Florida homestead sites, because I have a farm and, and, you know, uh, uh, being becoming self-sufficient is important to me. And then also some of these hunt lease Florida hunt lease. And you would not believe just this onslaught of I'm moving to Florida. You know, is there this I'm looking for land? I mean, it's just so maybe that's everywhere, but I yeah. have definitely seen a probably tenfold uptick in the past couple of years of people seeking places to hunt or seeking places to move in Florida, judging by what I'm seeing on social media. So you, uh, you hunt a lot of public land then, right? This, this is the first year that I've really just been like, I'm going to hunt as much public land as possible. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is this year I've fallen in love with it actually. So. Yeah. It's, um, I hunted a lot of private for years and then once I got in the public game, I have to say that it's more difficult, but I mm -hmm. feel like for me, it's made me a better hunter because it's, um, it's more of those struggles. I feel like I can go on public and really struggle, but then I'll go to private and be like, Gosh, this is almost like too easy. Or, and yeah, for, or if for it me, I like the up, struggle. If it doesn't happen just this way, then you're like, oh, this was a terrible hunt. Yeah. And you kind of don't feel that way on public land. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell on myself, this is really embarrassing, but hey, we're going to be wide open. Yeah. So I had some some health issues with my son. He's facing some surgery in his hand. He's a football player and a weightlifter. So I had just gotten kind of a bad diagnosis on that Monday for him. And I had planned the next morning I woke up, I couldn't think straight. When I can't think straight, I go to the woods. That's where that clears my mind. So I'm like, I'm going to go hunt. So I get, I mean, I've got my cart and I've got my stand and I've got my headlamp and my thermos. I've got everything. I pull up to my parking spot out on public land and I I'm loading everything up and I look and I'm like, where's my rifle? I did not bring my rifle. <laughs> now on private land, that would have felt like just an absolute bum. That would have been a lost cause, but I decided I was going to scout since I was out there. You know, I, once I got out there, I realized the wind wasn't in favor for where I was wanting to hunt anyway. So I used the opposite wind to scout a new area that I wasn't able to scout before. And I was rewarded with stumbling up on a jam up bedding area. <laughs> huh. And I, I marked it on my phone. And I don't know that I would have found that if I'd have just gone in there, in there to hunt like I had planned. So to me, being on public land, it's like, it, I feel like there's never really a bad day. You're always learning. I mean, that's hunting in general, but especially on public land, I just feel like it teaches you every time you go out there. 
I uh, I have nothing against private land. I love to hunt private land, oh, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes it can feel a little bit monotonous, like mm -hmm. going in, like for, for me, we hunt a lot of small plots, five, 10, 15 acres. So there's not a whole lot to put places to put stands and stuff. So mm -hmm. it, you park the truck, you walk to the same stand, right. you sit and you watch the same field. I feel yeah. like public land, it's like every time's different. You never know Absolutely. who's going to pull in the parking lot, push deer to you. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I like that. I think I like that change of scenery and um, the exciting factor of it. That I, everything I, constantly it. changes. Yeah. Well, I thought about this one day. When I, I live in a very beautiful area. Where I live is Hawthorne Cross Creek area. It's old Florida. It's where the yearling was written. You know, Marjorie Lee, uh, uh, Rawling. Marjorie Kennings Rawlings, I always say that incorrectly. So there's just a lot of old Florida charm. You know, there are beautiful lakes. We have a mud boat. We're out there a bunch. Just some of the sunsets and sunrises that we've seen, you just you just can't even imagine. But I find myself when I've gone to new places, it's like, wow, this is so beautiful. I wish I lived in an area like this. And one day I was just driving back from the feed store and it just I realized as I was driving down this winding road and there's just these beautiful pastures on either side. I was like, wait a minute, I live in a really gorgeous place. And I hear all the time people telling me what a beautiful area I live in, but it loses some of that wow factor when you see it all the time, you forget to appreciate it. So on public land, it's, it, it feels like that. Well, what I've experienced this year as I'm discovering more and more now, I'm like just so hungry for discovering public land. Um, it's just, it feels I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of acres. I mean, how can one person ever see all of that? Yeah. And it's just, it's really exciting. Um, what kind of app are you using on your phone to um, kind of map things out? So I use HuntStand and the reason I'm using HuntStand is because we started with HuntStand and all of our good spots are on HuntStand. I don't want to lose any of that. So even though there've been a couple of other apps that have come out that I've been really interested in and seem like they had more bells and whistles, I just haven't, I've been too lazy to try to transfer over and start new. So it's like, if this is working pretty well for me, I stick with it, but I use hunt stand and I love hunt stand. So, um, is there any kind of certain thing you do to narrow down kind of mm -hmm. where you're going to head to before, as far as like he's scouting? Yep. So the first thing I do is I look at it and I say to myself, where is the furthest place from where most of the people are going to be? What is the most inconvenient what looks like the roughest terrain. And that's where I start. Okay. Um, and once I get to that area, I look for, I look for places close to water. I always look for water creeks, you know, funnels up against creeks, places in between, you know, stuff like that. I look for water. And then once I look for water, because a lot of the area that I hunt in sometimes doesn't have good tree cover, mm -hmm. then I'll pull the, the tree cover map over and look for areas of uh, dense, uh, tree area because you know it does no good to have a good spot if you're trying to if you can't get above to see what's going on because all there is is scrubby crepe myrtles that are five foot high and you can't see through them if there's no tree to get up on so for me that's important is to is to find that um, and then from there I also there's something that I do and I'm probably going to tell all my secrets but you know whatever <laughs> I do a lot of stalking so I will look for an air like if there's an area I'm going to hunt I literally will type it into Facebook and pull up I'll, I'll put the name of that area and buck and I'll see every buck that people were foolish enough to to mark <laughs> yeah what's available in that area I'll look up all different um outdoors magazines, local magazines, and look at articles that may go back 10, 15, 20 years where some old timer said, well, if you follow this creek down to this part to this part over here, and I pay attention to that, and I'm constantly cataloging that information. Um, so that's kind of what I do. It's it's an all out stock fest. Like it gets a little bit creepy. <laughs> uh, that's a uh... That's funny that you you mentioned that you like Google all that stuff too because I thought I was the only person that does that. No. I'll I'll go back and read forums um, of an area yes. from um, Archery Talk or something from mm -hmm. 2009, 2007, yes. yep. That's me. and and people are talking about oh the island or out in the field or so and so and I'm uh -huh. like I'm driving by that after work and looking yeah. and seeing if that Take island's that. still I'm there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit about like when you're out hunting by yourself, um, mm -hmm. maybe a 
crazy uh, group of guys drives by or something like that. Is there anything wild or crazy you've ever seen like out maybe on public land or private land? Um, any kind of crazy encounters with people or animals or? Um... No, not so much so far. Um, you know, the, the, the weirdest thing I've come across so far is I did encounter a bobcat that had the longest legs I've ever seen. Like this bobcat literally looked like it was on stilts to the point that when he first came in, I thought he was a deer because his legs were so long. And then I thought, okay, well, that's a panther maybe. But then when he got close, I'm like, no, this is a bobcat. It was freaky how long the legs were. I mean, it was literally up on stilts. So that was interesting, <laughs> just seeing things like that. Um, but other than that, I haven't really encountered anything you know super crazy as of yet so um i know you're on go wild it's kind of mm -hmm. like an app for uh, you know posting hunting and stuff that's uncensored do you like to document a lot of your stuff like if you see a bobcat or um mm -hmm. or you just kind of like to live in the moment um i you know i really like to enjoy the moment um i do like to video things. I love, I, my family will tell you I'm a picture taker and a video taker because mm -hmm. I love memories. I love reliving moments and what that sounded like and what that felt like and what I was feeling at that moment and what I was thinking at that moment. So, um, if I feel like I can take a picture or video without it compromising the moment, then by all means I'll do it. Um, especially if it's something that I'm not really interested in hunting at that moment, you know, then yeah. by, you know, that just seems like a bunch of fun. It's something I can show my husband or my children. And, you know, um, I love the challenge of seeing how stealthy I can be, how close do they get before they notice I'm there. Everything. It's all kind of like a little game to me. <laughs> so. Have you ever thought about, uh, uh, taking out a camcorder camera equipment with you? Or is that, that too much? I have, I have, um, you know, and something that I know that you already talked about last night, but what has been making me consider the possibility of taking camera equipment out more is my um, my goal of switching to saddle hunting more this year. I think that would maybe free up. Right now, I'm carrying a summit stand on my back, and I've got my I, I carry a, a sling choke pack, pack because I can slide it around to the front, and I've got my sidearm. I'm trying to make sure it's accessible in case I need it, and I've got my rifle or my bow, and I've got you know the thermocell running, and I'm trying to keep from knocking it off on stuff. So there's so much going on, and I'm trying to be quiet, and I'm trying to keep the wind in my face, but it just doesn't really cross my mind. <laughs> it's yeah. not an option, but my goal this year is to, to pick up saddle hunting because it just makes so much more sense as much as I, you know, I've been researching it for about three years now and I'm just about ready to, to take the plunge. And I think maybe once I'm doing that and I'm just traveling light, I may consider bringing a camera with me. Yeah. That, that saddle hunting, that's a big thing for me this year. I'm taking the plunge. It's a yeah. little bit expensive to get into, but mm -hmm. Um, I'm tired of carrying a uh, big summit around the woods and right. clanking on me and everything else. Um, do you have one that you've got picked out or are you still trying to decide? No, I've actually been contacting all the different companies. They have been so gracious. Um, I had a, a gentleman from Tethered actually call me this afternoon and spent like 35 or 40 minutes on the phone with me answering questions. Oh, wow. I have, um, there, there is a local saddle hunting, uh, uh, saddle, what is the word? manufacturer that is out of Jacksonville. They're called um, Woods, Wood Saddle Stands, I think is what they're called. I'm probably messing that all up, but it's, I think it's Alicia and Robert Wood. So they're mm -hmm. local to me. They're only about an hour away. They've actually offered for me to come out next weekend and just try some stuff on. Um, it's a husband and a wife and the wife is very similar to me in build. So she kind of already has a leg up to, Hey, this, I, this works for me. So this would probably work for you. And they're doing like um, a saddle hunter meetup at mm -hmm. one of the WMAs in a few weeks to try to get people together and people that are interested so they can go out and see all the different type of saddles that are available. So um, I don't have any particular brand in mind. I'm just looking and figuring out. Um, I also, uh, I think it's H2. It's H2. I hate when I try to 
list. Yeah. I think it's H2 Saddles. Um, I've, I, they've been in communication with me answering some questions. So far, they've all been so gracious and spent so much time answering questions. Haven't tried to push or sway me one way or another. Just told me what their product was good at and what the benefit was. So I, I haven't really set, I don't know, I haven't really set my sights on any particular thing just yet. Yeah, I'm kind of eyeballing the uh, cruiser. I think it's called like the Acron or Acon mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like it because it seems to be like it's um, you. You can pull it down pretty far, and I like to sit a lot. So yeah. I, I'm not one of those person that wants to lean. I want to kind of feel like I'm more in a hammock. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of torn between what sticks to buy too. There's a lot of stuff out there, so I want to make sure so I make much. the right purchase. I told each one of them to that uh, when I was taught each one of those companies that I feel like the more I research, the more confused I get, you know, yeah. because it's not like, okay, here's this kit, go get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, there's so much. So, and especially being a really small frame, narrow waisted, narrow hipped person, you know, I'm thinking about that. Like it is, I mean, one size doesn't fit all. I don't want to feel like I'm like splawed out and, you know, whatever. Yeah. I'm comfortable. So trying to figure out what uh, companies kind of accommodate more petite framed people and, and that type of thing. So there's a lot of research to be done, especially when you're, hopefully this is something I never have to buy again. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's how I'm looking at it too. I was looking at the prices of the platform and um, right, right. all the tethers and stuff that come with it and the sticks. And I was like, mm -hmm. I want to make it make the purchase one time. I'm going to have it yes. for 20 years. I don't, yes. um, I don't want to get it and be unsatisfied. So I want to jump in to getting kids involved in the outdoors. You have okay. experience with that. So yes. um, when you're introducing kids to the outdoors, what advice would you give to somebody? Um, I think the biggest advice is when you first introduce a child to the outdoors, Go ahead and just resign yourself to the fact that the first five or maybe 10 times, you're not going to see anything because they are literally going to bust and scare everything out of the woods because they don't understand and they're learning. But at the same time, if you're really um, staunch with them and you're constantly be quiet, stop moving, you're going to squash the magic of being outdoors with them. So mm -hmm. you just have to kind of pour it on them slowly. You know, the first time, but this is, I think this is parenting in general. Anytime you introduce, do something new, if it's just surrounded with all these do's and don'ts and we're stressful, it's just, it's going to turn the child off to that. And so you want to make it as fun as possible. You want to make sure you have snacks. You want to make sure that you're pointing out the things that are so cool and amazing in your teaching. So to me, the first several times, it's not even about, are you actually going to be successful? It's about pointing out those things. It's about sitting there and hearing the squirrels sound off and going, hey, when you hear that, start looking. Because when you hear the squirrels sound off, now if they sound off like this, it might be a deer walking through the woods or whatever. But if the squirrels are sounding off and the birds are sounding off, it's probably some kind of cat. Like teaching those little things to them that are just really cool. Or when you hear the crows, the crows typically only sound off if they hear something walking or something moving. So pay attention to that. So those little things, teaching them those cool things, um, you know, seeing the fireflies when the sun's going down, making sure do you see that lighten up? Those are the, you know, things like that. It's just making sure that they enjoy the experience you'll have you'll have plenty of time to teach them to be quiet <laughs> the road. just help them fall in love with the woods first so i know it's probably different with everybody's kids but do you think there's an age um that you should start at that do you think it's um maybe younger is like three or do you think mm -hmm. they need to be more it depends on the child it yeah. really depends on the child i have four children and I have two grandchildren and I have a, a third grandbaby on the way. And if there's one thing I've learned is it doesn't matter if all of those children came the, from the same genetics, they are all completely different. And you have to pay, you have to be mindful of their attention spans. And, you know, for one child, the best way to get them involved in the outdoors, maybe duck hunting where they don't have to be so still, mm -hmm. you know, so you just, you have to really, and, and, you know, the, the, the first time you take a child hunting, you know, the first major day that there's a hard freeze might not be the best day to take them out for the first time and just break their heart right off the bat, you know, where they just can't get warm. So, you know, I mean, every child's different. I think you just have to read your own child. But as long as they're having fun, um, 
then, you know, you just have that. That's what you play on. You really play on making that be fun and helping them fall in love with it. So. So I have to imagine that you remember all your kids first hunts. Um, yeah. Do you remember um, the first time they killed something? Were you there I to do. experience that? with Well, them? you know, the <laughs> so my youngest will tell you the story about this time that I was sitting with him and um, we saw this nice buck. Um, he, we were sitting in this spot where the stranded trees came over and then there was, there's a break in the, in the strand and then there was another strand and he was coming up that strand just beautifully about to cross over. And I look over and my son is out cold asleep. <laughs> I'm trying to wake him quietly without moving too much. And I'm like, there's a deer, there's a deer. And of course he's got sleep in his eyes. We can't see anything. And so I grunt at this buck and he comes running straight for us. Like he is just hot and heavy. And, and I'm like, here he comes, get your, get your gun up. And he's like, I can't see him. I can't see him. And here this buck comes running and he stops for about two seconds. And he's about to cross the trail, the, the, the truck trail. And then he's going to pass over into thick woods possibly never to be seen again. And at this point I go, I'm so sorry, son, but I can't let him walk. <laughs> and he, until he killed his first buck, he held that against me. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, he, so my son actually killed his first buck sitting with my husband because he was still mad at me actually. <laughs> and then, but the first time he sat by himself, um, he, the story is just, I love it. Um, he was, he was sitting in the stand and he fell asleep mm -hmm. and then he woke up and he was hungry. So he dug into his pack and got his trail mix and he's just snacking on trail mix. And he looks up and he sees a buck standing there. And he said, mom, I thought I was still asleep. Like I just, so I rub my eyes and I look and I'm like, no, that's a buck. And that's a big buck. So he tries to pull his gun up, knocks the trail mix over. It spills all over the place. Then he clings his rifle against the side of the stand. And all this time, the buck just looks at him. It was just, you know, and then he puts the scope on the buck and he squeezes the trigger and the look on his face and watching him tell that story, it just... There was so much. I was so proud. Um, another fun story. The, the, the person in our family that's actually killed the biggest, nicest buck is actually my oldest son. And he killed just this monster 12 point, just tall. I mean, just ridiculous. We had, he was just gorgeous. But that day that he hunted, he had been in trouble. So we had uh -oh. taken his phone, we had taken his phone from him. So we knew where he was. We weren't super far from where he was, but he didn't get to have his phone. So he's sitting in the stand all by himself. Um, he was close to the camp. So we didn't feel, I mean, if something happened, there were people, you know, right there at the camp. So it wasn't like we felt like he was unsafe. Um, but he was sitting there and it, he had only been there maybe 30 minutes. And he looks over and he just sees something at the edge of the field. So he spins his gun around. He looks, he sees the antlers. He shoots. And then he walks over, he waits about 40 minutes, still can see that it's laying there. It hasn't moved. It dropped right where he, he hit it. And at this point, we didn't really understand what kind of deer, you know, this was in Georgia. We had been used to seeing deer in Florida. Mm -hmm. And he walks up on this deer and he said, mom, when I walked up on it and I saw its feet sticking out, I thought, oh no, I have shot somebody's cow. Like that's what he thought. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was so excited when he picked the antlers up and looked at this buck and he couldn't tell anybody till dark because he was there by himself and didn't have a phone. So he <laughs> sat there. He said, I kept, I, I was just, I would try to get my mind off of it. And then I would look and then I would go back down there and look at him and I just couldn't believe it. And I couldn't tell anybody. He was so excited. He was nearly jumping up and down in the field when we pulled up to pick him up. So <laughs> those are the things that are just, you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't buy it. It's just so much fun. So is there a is there a competition between your family about who kills the biggest deer? There's an unspoken one. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you know there has to be a friendly converse, competition, and you know we are all so excited, no matter who in the family harvest something, but we've got to keep it going. I mean, I'm I have four boy, three boys, and one girl. My poor girl, she just got grouped in with these boys, you know, I'd go to leave somewhere and I'd be like, come on boys. Oh, oh, I mean, and you sister too, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. poor thing. she's just been raised with boys. So there's the thick competition that we allow ourselves to have within the family. I don't like them to treat 
other people that way. Yeah. But we do. We, I, I'm a boy, I, you know, I'm definitely more of a boy mom and I hash it out. I can hash out the, the, the smack talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to you a little bit before we got on the show. You mentioned that you do a little bit of beekeeping. I know this isn't oh, yeah. like hunting related, but it's outdoors and food and stuff. Right. So we're going to talk about it on this podcast. Um, can you kind of tell me how you got involved with beekeep, uh, beekeeping and like why it interests you? Um, well, you know, I have a garden. And so anything that can improve pollination, mm -hmm. I'm all for because I want to have the, 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 the nicest, biggest, most well-formed fruits and vegetables. So that was one draw. Um, also, I tend to have a, um, an affinity for things that are challenging and can cause me pain. <laughs> but um, what I found after I started working with my first sets of, of, of bee colonies, um, I'm a person that has struggled with anxiety in the past. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of those things I'm very open about it. You know, there's been a mental health struggle that I've kind of walked through. And one of the things that I've learned about hunting, but also about beekeeping is that it improves my mental health. And so mm -hmm. with beekeeping, the bees, I feel like they match your energy. So you can't go in there all up tight because they're going to reflect that. So you have to kind of pull yourself to a place where you're calm and you're moving slow and, and purposefully. And so it was the first place that I started kind of feeling like I was winning my war with anxiety was with beekeeping. Huh. And then like I've told you, you know, I'm a student, so I just love to voraciously just learn as much as I can. And the more I watch them and the more I learned about them, they're just so fascinating. Um, the way they communicate to each other, when they find a food source, they come back and they do this waggle dance and you, and all the other bees kind of gather around them because they're learning this dance because with this dance is coming it is they're learning the geographical location of whatever this food source is that they found. And it's just, it's, so neat to watch that so just all those different things watching whenever you know for the first part of a bee's life i think it's 14 or 15 days they never step foot out of the hive they're all inside so they don't relieve themselves so the first thing they do the first time they fly is they move up the ranks and their role is relieve themselves and then they do this orientation flight where they figure out where their colony is in respect to the trees around them in respect to the sun to the point that if you move that colony, there's this this uh, saying with beekeeping that you have to e you have to either move it two feet or two miles, because huh. if you do anything otherwise, the bees will try to go back to that spot where the colony was, and they could starve or die or whatever because they are so honed in on this location. So you either have to move it slightly or make it completely different, where they have to relearn it all over again. Again, it's just fascinating. <laughs> that, that's super interesting. I never realized I, I kind of just thought you put bees in a box and kind of just collected the honey. I never realized that there was that no, much to lot. it. There's a lot. So in Florida, because we have very little freezing snows, mm -hmm. um, there for us, there's something called the dearth when the food is very limited as far as for the bees. For most people, that happens in the dead of winter when it's snowing. Well, in Florida, that's in the heat of the summer when things aren't blooming. So that's actually when the bees will struggle the most in Florida is in the hottest part of summer when nothing is blooming and there hasn't been a rain and that type of thing. So that's kind of flipped. Now we have things bloom for longer periods of time, but also we have more issues with pests because we don't have good seasons to really kill off hive beetles and, 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 and that sort of thing. So there are lots, there are a lot of many benefits, but there are also many hurdles to overcome with, you know, just being in Florida, trying to, trying to raise bees. <laughs> so do you, do you feel like you talked about being calmer on the bees and everything, helping your anxiety and stuff? Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel, I imagine hunting being, um, out deer hunting, you know, in serenity and all that stuff has helped that too. Do you feel Absolutely. like you, mm -hmm. um, got the bees so you could kind of like get that feeling without mm -hmm. actually having to go out? Cause you don't always have that time to get out right. to the woods and everything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything about, I mean, the outdoors is it, all, everything about it's therapeutic to me. Um, there, the majority of my life I spent 
as kind of like an introvert, anti-social type person. I actually had convinced myself at one point that I just hated people. And then I realized that it wasn't the people that I hated. It was the way I was relating to them. And so one of the things that I love about the outdoors, that I love about beekeeping, that I love about farming is that, you know, I'm not the type of woman that can sit down and just stare at somebody over a cup of coffee and know what to do. I mean, I get really awkward. I don't know what to say, but I can come over and help you feed your pigs and work with you. Or I can help go out and let's go find some hogs. And in that space, I believe you see more of the real me anyways. Mm -hmm. And um, so to me, anything done outdoors allows me to build more genuine relationships with people. So I've just learned that I don't dislike people. I just had to learn what my connection point was with them. And, you know, so that's super super interesting. Um, So I have one last question. What would be your dream hunt and what would be the reason that you would pick that over something else? Mm -hmm. Let's just say that money and travel and COVID and all this stuff isn't Mm -hmm. in the factory. You can go anywhere in the world. Um, And you can, maybe you can take somebody with you, maybe your husband or your kids or all of them. What would you pick? Um, You know, even though there are so many things to choose from, for some reason to me, elk is it like that is on my, that's, yeah. Because of the hiking and the scenery and the, you know, I love that. Um, But, and it would be, it would be archery for sure with, you know, an elk with a bow um, just because it seems so daunting and so impossible and so challenging. Um, And I've just heard how delicious they are and I've never had to try them. (laughs) I've never had a chance to try them. So I want to, but yeah, for me, it's elk hunting. Definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm stocking up my little DIY folder and file and just gathering all the information I can and learning who releases tags when and how much they are. And, you know, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm getting there one day. <laughs> I was going to ask you if it was going to be guided or if it was going to be DIY. I, I imagine like, it would be DIY. I would like for it to be DIY. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. There, for me, definitely so much of the, the, the draw of hunting is, is figuring it out, failing and failing and failing. And then all of a sudden it lining up. So. So could you tell everybody where they could find you on social media if they want to yeah, connect? Absolutely. So I'm on Facebook as Lola Fit Outdoors. Lola because I'm a Lola. That's my grandma name. And Fit because I'm a nurse and I really value health. And I, I do a lot of teaching and education about just being healthy and what that means. So Lola Fit Outdoors on Facebook, Lola Fit Outdoors on Instagram. And then I also have a Go Wild um, account and it's just under my name, Tiffany Sanders. Okay, cool. Um, well, we're gonna, we're gonna cut out of this live here and, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and, uh, really enjoyed the chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yes, ma'am. I, uh, I'll catch up with you soon. Okay. All right. All right. See ya.